of a clean DACA bill is. And within that bill, he thinks that you have to include uh, not just fixing the pro not just fixing DACA, but closing the loopholes and making sure we have a solution on that front, so we don't create a problem and find ourselves right back where we started in one, two, three years later. Which is which is clearly different than her perspective on a clean DACA bill, because she clearly stated that she thinks they should do a clean DACA bill, just handle the Dreamers, and then handle border security as part of comprehensive immigration reform. The so, problem. So is the, the president setting himself up here for a battle where the Democrats are going to say, "No, let's just do DACA." And he's on the other side, and then there's no coming together. Of I think the president is setting himself up uh, to achieve what everybody in that room agreed they wanted to see happen, and that is a deal on DACA, a deal on border security, talking about chain migration and visa lottery. That's where we are in this process. Those are the four principles. Matthew. Thanks. There are two quick questions, if I may. Uh, <coughs> the Democrats said after the meeting uh, that they support border security measures and that their understanding is that the president uses the term wall and border security interchangeably. Is that true? We certainly believe uh, that the wall is part of border security. That's one component of it. Uh, we firmly, again, believe that border security has to be part of this negotiation and part of this deal. So, and then if, just very quickly, um, is there any update from the White House on the process of deciding uh, if and if so how bump stocks should be regulated. That's something we haven't touched on in a while. Yeah, I know that was uh, something that the uh, ATF was uh, doing a full review on, and we anticipate uh, the results of that to come back, and we'll certainly make a decision once that's been done. But the Department of Justice asked that that take place. Blake. Sarah, thank you. During that meeting, the President also talked about earmarks, saying essentially it could lower the hostility here in D.C. and lead to both sides coming together, but is he not concerned also that it could also lead to runaway spending? Look, the president said you have to be careful with that and you have to have controls on earmarks. The broader point the president was making is that partisan politics have become a big problem in Washington. We've gotten to a place where Democrats and Republicans are fighting more than they're fixing, and he wants to find uh, different ways to bring more and more Democrats and Republicans uh, to work together on legislation to move our country forward, and he threw that out as one suggestion on how we might be able to do that. Is the president expected to, or is he planning on making this an annual event, uh, him going to Davos, and do you have any details on what days, I believe it's a four-day event, when he might actually go? We're still finalizing the details on exactly when the president will be there. Uh, we don't have any commitments beyond this year at this point. But as we said earlier today in a statement, the president will attend, uh, and he welcomes the opportunity to go there and advance his America First agenda with world leaders. Um, and he is very much looking forward to being part of that process. Margaret. Hi, Sarah. Um, question not shocking. It's also on Davos. Um, during the campaign, the Trump campaign made the decision not to go, and it was a concern at the time, was that uh, this is viewed by some as a gathering of global elites, so that wasn't the president's <clears throat> campaign message or message to his base. And obviously, you guys have, you're thinking on this has evolved a little bit about who it's a message for and what message you can do. But is this, uh, has this thinking Our thinking on... hasn't changed at all, just to be extremely clear. Uh, the president's message is very much the same here as it will be there, just the same as it was here as it was when uh, he made many stops in Asia. This is very much uh, an America first agenda. The president is still 100 percent focused and committed to promoting policies that promote strength for American businesses and the American worker, and that's going to be the same whether he's in the U.S. or any other place. What I wanted to ask also is, do you have a fuller picture of that U.S. delegation that you could share with us? Um, at this at this time, we're finalizing uh, the the details, but you can expect that a number of uh, senior members of the cabinet uh, and administration will be part of, of uh, this event. Some will stay for a more extended period of time than the president. Leaders to <coughs> by last while he's there. Again, we're finalizing the details of the trip as all those things are locked in. Uh, we'll certainly make sure you guys are well aware. Cecilia, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Ivanka Trump phrased on Twitter, Oprah. Uh, pretty effusively. She said, let's all come together, women and men, say, time's up. Is that the message from this White House, the support of this, this time's up movement? 
Uh, look, I think the message from the White House uh, is obviously that everyone should come together. I think you saw a great example of the president's focus on that and his leadership in that effort by bringing Democrats and Republicans together to talk about a very contentious <laughs> issue, one that's been gone that's gone on for years. The debate has never ended in real solutions. We are trying to move that forward, whether it's on immigration or a number of other issues. I think the president's showing his leadership on that front, and we're going to continue to look for ways to bring the country together. Have you been on the campaign of a political outsider? What advice would you give a political outsider like Oprah, who seems intrigued about uh, the idea of running? Uh, I'm not going to focus on anyone's campaign other than President Trump's uh, re-election. I'm sure she, if she decides to run, which I think the president states he doesn't feel she will, uh, I'm sure she'll have help with that. She qualified? Uh, look, I, I disagree very much on her policies. Is she a successful individual? Absolutely. But in terms of uh, where she stands on a number of positions, I would find a lot of uh, problems with that. But that'd be something she would have to determine and lay out if she made a decision to run and what that campaign would look like. Michael. Can I ask just a, a question about phase two of the immigration issue as the president laid it out today? Um, so once you get past the DACA debate and some of these other issues, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham seemed to lay on the table the idea of something that S Senator Graham supports, which is a, a comprehensive plan that would include a path to citizenship for all 11 or 12 million, however many you count them, people that are illegally in this country. And the president seemed to respond, you know, let's do it, let's go for it, something along those lines. So are, are we to then take away that, that the president is firmly committed to a path to citizenship? And to trying to, to get to a path to citizenship for all 11 million illegal immigrants in the country uh, once once phase two comes. Like right, our, our focus is on the four things that I laid out. Okay. That's phase where our one. negotiation is, and that's phase one. And that's our, hold on, that's our focus and our priority. Uh, we're certainly open to talking about uh, a number of other issues when it comes to immigration, but right now this administration is focused on those four things and that negotiation uh, and not a lot else at this front. Zeke. Hey, sir, I'll shoot for you real quick. Um, overnight, uh, news came out that uh, the North Koreans will be sending a delegation to the uh, Olympics in South Korea. The White House have any, have any response to that, and will have any impact on American participation in the games? Uh, firstly, and then secondly, uh, first comment on Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Let me first. start with the first thing. Um, in terms of it doesn't affect the U.S. participation in the Olympics, the North Korean participation is an opportunity for the regime to see the value of ending its international isolation by denuclearizing. Uh, we hope that we can continue to move forward on that front, uh, but certainly doesn't affect our participation. Uh, announce a delegation soon? Uh, yes, we do, uh, and that will happen probably in the coming days, and we'll make sure again we keep on. all of you guys certainly in the loop. President Joe Ohio running for the Senate. Um, the President obviously pardoned him. Uh, was the White House supporter of his candidacy as the President might campaign for him? Uh, as you know, I can't comment on the specifics of any election uh, voicing support for a candidate in a race like that. Does the president believe it's appropriate for somebody who's been pardoned for a crime to run for? Uh, I'm not going to weigh into the details of that race or make comments on something that would affect that front. Stephen. Thanks, sir. Just to take another stab at, at Michael's question, can you help us understand the term as the president used it? What does comprehensive immigration reform mean to this White House? Uh, again, our focus, like I told Michael, is those four priorities, uh, border security, ending chain migration, ending the visa lottery system, and coming up with a permanent uh, solution to DACA. That's where we're focused, and that's what we're going to uh, be committed to during this negotiation process. As much as the president today seemed to say, okay, let's go on to comprehensive immigration reform the afternoon. As he said, he said once we get through this process, he said, let's let's get this deal done and then we'll take an hour off and then we'll move on to the next phase of the negotiation. Right now, this administration is focused on those things uh, and making sure we get that deal done and then we'll move forward from that point. So Jessica, the president not decided what comprehensive immigration reform means to him? Look, I'm not going to negotiate with you from the podium. This is something uh, that the leadership agreed to, uh, primarily led by Kevin McCarthy and the president in this meeting, that this would be the focus uh, coming out of today. Let's get a deal on this, and then we'll move forward and talk about other things. Jessica. Sarah, on trade, um, there's a meeting of trade officials, I understand, at the White House today concerning the trade agenda for 2018. What is, 
How much will trade and trade action, particularly against China, be part of the Trump administration agenda this year? Well, we're going to continue uh, to push for making sure we have the best deals possible, certainly deals that benefit the American worker. And we have specifics on that uh, following meetings that take place. We'll keep you guys aware. But our position is going to be to continue to fight for and push for uh, better trade deals that benefit this country and American workers. Jordan. North Korea, if you can just clarify in the delegation we're sending, are Jared and Ivanka going? Uh, I, I didn't actually announce the delegation. I said that we would have that announcement in the coming days, and that will um, be when we release the names of who's attending. Jordan. Uh, thanks, Sarah. It's, it's pretty unusual for us in the press corps to have a, a front row seat to those kind of negotiations in the, in the cabinet room for Lucky around an hour. Um, whose decision was it to allow the press in to witness that entire negotiation, and what was the goal of having us sit there and watch? Just to be clear, you weren't there for uh, the entire negotiation because the deal didn't take place until after you guys left. Uh, but. It, I think a number of individuals in the room felt it was a good thing to let you see the cooperation uh, and the conversation between uh, both sides and see how we're working and leading to move the ball down the field and come up with some real solutions. John? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, going back to the wall, uh, last summer, Governor Gracchus, the head of the Mexican Governors Association, said that when the president started talking about a price tag on building the wall, that meant he'd given up on his idea of making Mexico pay for it. Now, in his remarks in Tennessee and in his recent speeches, the president has talked about the cost of the wall, and there's been no mention and of his standard phrase, and Mexico will pay for it. Has the president abandoned the idea of Mexico paying for the wall? No, he hasn't. Um, on trade again, uh, negotiations on NAFTA will start again at the end of, uh, of uh, January in Montreal. Listening to the president in Tennessee yesterday, is he more hopeful? Does he still plan on scrapping the deal if he can't get everything he wants? Uh, look, the president, as, as we've said many times before, wants to make sure that we have a deal that benefits America and American workers. And we're going to continue through that process and make sure that whatever we do, uh, we get the best deal possible. A little more hopeful than you was six months ago? Uh, look, I think the president's always been hopeful that we can get a better deal. I think that's why he ran for president, is to make sure that he's pushing an agenda that helps Americans and particularly helps American workers. And he's ho hoping to uh, close a lot of those trade deficits and get rid of some of the bad trade deals that we've had in the past. Olivier? Thanks, sir. Uh, sir, when the president declined to certify that the Iran nuclear deal was in the uh, U.S. national interest, a couple months ago, he said he needed to see action in Congress and from American allies. Um, has he seen enough of that action? Senator Corker's under the impression that it's possible that there's been enough progress on, legis on the legislative fix, at least, that the president might be willing to not reimpose sanctions. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't made a final decision on that, uh, and we certainly will in the coming days, and we'll make sure, uh, once again, you guys are some of the first to know. Peter. Sir, just to be clear, if the president wants a bill of love, why doesn't he drop the demand for a border wall and deal with the dreamers alone immediately? Uh, because you have to have a uh, full solution to this problem. You have to make sure uh, that you're taking every step in border security, and you want to make sure that if you fix things on DACA, you don't create and exacerbate the problem and have to deal with it again in a year. The president wants to make sure uh, we have a clean solution to that front, and that's what we're going to do. So what does the president say to young men like 24-year-old Jesus Contreras? He's from Houston. He's a paramedic. He's been working hard in this country to help make other lives better who are now waiting for Congress to come up with something or they may get shipped to a country they've never known. He says exactly what he just did in that room. Let's work together. Let's figure this out. I'm leading on this effort and bringing all the members uh, that need to be part of the conversation to the table. And he said he was confident that they would come together and get it done. And so that's what we're going to do. Just a quick one about last night only because it made I'm going to keep moving because we're going to be short Sarah, on time. Chris, go ahead. Uh, Sarah, the, over the holidays, the uh, president terminated the uh, tenure of the members of the President's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. Does the president want to see those solutions refilled his administration? Uh, we're looking at the different options, and we'll keep you posted if we have an announcement on that. That front. Sure. Steve. Is he going to add any stops to the Davos trip? And is he actually going to address the group there? Uh, there aren't any plans for additional stops, and we'll keep you posted on all the details of the schedule. Trey. Thanks, sir. Two 
questions for you. First, does the White House have any reaction uh, to the testimony that was released today uh, by Senator Feinstein's office uh, regarding the Fusion GPS dossier? Uh, I haven't uh, had any conversations with anybody specific to that front, so. Uh, and if I could follow up uh, on the immigration meetings today, is the President concerned about the differences that Democrats and Republicans have uh, when it comes to defining phrases like border security? They have a lot of things that they uh, agree on, and that's what we're going to focus on. But again, I'm not going to negotiate with you guys. Look, I've laid out what the principles and the priorities are and what all of the individuals in the meeting today agreed to narrow the scope to, and that's what we're going to continue to push for. Jake. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. First of all, on border security, we're hearing a lot about immigration. How big of a role, though, does drug trafficking play right now in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, president and uh, Congress? And uh, it's certainly a factor. It's one of the reasons that the president is very committed to border security, wants to stop the in influx of drugs coming into this country. But surely it's going to be more than just the wall, because drugs are very easily flung over a wall, right? Correct. Border security is uh, more than just the wall. And about, uh, and about the uh, report that uh, Mueller is uh, expecting to be sitting down with the president in uh, the coming weeks. What do you have to tell us about that? Uh, the same thing that we've said many times before, that the White House is not going to comment on communications with the special counsel out of respect for the special counsel and its process, but we're going to continue to be in full cooperation with them. Charlie? Thank you, Sarah. A lot of immigration critics believe that a DACA deal, by its very nature, should, is considered to be amnesty. Does the White House believe that that is amnesty? Uh, no, and we believe that uh, this is an important part of the process, and again, one that we're committed to finding a solution for. See. Yes, Sarah. Has uh, President Trump been briefed by President Moon on the uh, negotiations that the South Koreans had with the North Koreans? And what would this White House like to see as the next steps from Pyongyang? Uh, I mean, I think certainly the next steps would be uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is our number one priority and certainly what we would like to see. Uh, we are in very close contacts with the South, our South Korean allies about uh, these conversations. The president spoke with uh, Moon over the weekend. Uh, they, I don't believe they've spoken since then, but I know uh, officials from our administration have been in touch with officials from the South Korean side. Jim. Uh, just to be uh, crystal clear on this, uh, does the president want a wall in exchange for uh, giving those dreamers protection? The president wants border security. Okay. And, and just to be clear. Okay. So what does border security in entail? Does it include the wall at this stage, or could the wall wait until later? Uh, the wall is one of the pieces, uh, as well as technology uh, and another a number of other uh things that have been laid out by the Department of Homeland Security. I believe that Secretary Nielsen spoke about that pretty extensively at the meeting today, uh, that, and that portion was so, covered by so you all during has, that time frame. It all has to be part of a deal in order for these dreamers to have protection. Border security does have to be part of uh, this process. I mean, there's, a there's a difference, Why we right? want to secure our border? I absolutely do, because the safety and security of the people of this country are the president's number one responsibility and his number one priority when it comes to anything that he does. So absolutely. That, you understand how Andrew? the law could be different than border security, sir. Border security can no, mean actually, drones. I don't, it can mean agents, it could be more fencing, it doesn't necessarily mean a physical And that's part of the negotiation the that we expect Congress to have. But you, and you and understand Democrats are saying that they may not be in favor of this kind of deal. That they're if not Democrats are in favor of protecting American citizens, then I think we've hit a sad day in American history, but I don't believe that to be the case, because as we heard many of them say as they sat around that table when several of you were in the room, they are committed to border security. They do want it, and most of them have voted for it previously uh, before this legislation hit the floor. Yeah, so anything different no is just... Wall. They say thanks, but no thanks for a wall. Jim, I'm not negotiating okay. with you. I'm going to let Congress take care of that. Andrew? Sure. Thanks, sir. I just want to go back to the, to the question of Davos. Can you tell us a little bit about how this decision perhaps came about and what influenced it? Was it, was there any, <coughs> excuse me, was there any parts of it uh, taken into account Xi Jinping's appearance there last year? And he kind of seemed to take center stage and step into a, a kind of uh, space that had been left open by the, by the U.S.? No, I, I think it's about the president, uh, once again welcoming the opportunity to talk about the America First agenda and that's what his plan is to do and that's 
the main reason that he's going there is to continue to promote and talk about that uh, with the world leaders that will attend and some of the uh, obviously leaders of the economy in this country. Yes, Sarah. Sarah. Does the president have a fixed set of principles and priorities for comprehensive immigration reform, or does he believe that that's something he should be flexible on when it comes to that? Uh, look, as I've said, I'm not going to negotiate with you guys. We're going to do that with Congress. Uh, we've laid out what we want right now, and we'll make announcements when we move beyond those four priorities that we've laid out. Take one last question. Sarah, the President said on Saturday that Robert Mueller's investigation makes our country look foolish, and he's expressed a similar sentiment a couple times before, but what does he mean specifically about making the country look foolish? I think when we waste uh, the amount of time that we have on something like this that's been very clear from the beginning that there is absolutely nothing to. If we want to look at places where there may be collusion, I think our uh, administration has outlined where we think any special counsel should be focused, and it's certainly not on this president or the president's campaign. Thanks so much, guys. Can you take one on the, uh, national Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, uh, White House headlines today, protect the dreamers and he'll sign it. Build a wall in some places, do comprehensive immigration reform later. And pork barrel politics, that's good. Bring back earmarks in Congress. I'm Shepard Smith in New York. Those headlines from an extraordinary get-together at the White House today. President Trump and lawmakers from both parties this afternoon in a rare cabinet room on-camera negotiation over immigration. Sarah Sanders called the talks very successful. Today's meeting with a bipartisan group of nearly two dozen lawmakers lasted close to an hour and covered a range of immigration issues, specifically border security, chain migration, the visa lottery program, and the Dreamers. President Trump today called on lawmakers to put country before party. I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. <clears throat> But it also has to be a bill where we're able to secure our border. Drugs are pouring into our country at a record pace. A lot of people are coming in that we can't have. The president said today he will sign DACA, protection for the Dreamers, hundreds of thousands of people who came into the country with their parents but no documents. This has been highly controversial. Many conservatives have called it amnesty. But the president says Congress should get it done and he'll sign it. He even suggested do DACA and some border security, sign it into law, then start on comprehensive immigration reform in the next hour. Mr. Trump is calling for an end to the visa lottery program and what critics call chain migration, the program that lets immigrants already living in the United States sponsor their relatives to come here as well. And the president has changed his stance on a border wall. Instead of a big, beautiful wall with a big, beautiful door, what he told voters over and over and over again, now he advocates for a wall in some areas, technology and patrols in other areas. Quoting, we don't need a 2,000-mile wall. Remember, to get protection for Dreamers, DACA, there must be more border security. They're not calling it a wall anymore. Now they call it border security. And today, the number two Democrat in the House, the Congressman Steny Hoyer of Maryland, said both parties want better border security, but that they disagree on how to go about it. We need to take care of these DACA kids, and we all agree on that. There are some things that you're proposing that are going to be very controversial and will be an impediment to agreement. But you're going to negotiate those things. They'll negotiate it. President Trump has given lawmakers until March to come up with a bill to protect the Dreamers, though it now sounds like that may have switched a little. Comprehensive immigration reform, he says, can happen after. It's a new day. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live in the briefing room. Man, a lot of things getting all topsy-turvy there. Yeah, it was really interesting to watch the whole thing unfold, Shep, and it's an exercise in democracy that I have not seen in any White House that I have covered. You know, actually having cameras in there for not the entire meeting, but the bulk of it. The White House was quick to come out, though, and say that in the closed-door session of the meeting, after the pool cameras left, uh, there was an agreement that was reached between the president, the senators on both sides of the aisle, and the members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, to take up immigration in a two-phase process, phase one being find a fix 
products for the so-called Dreamers, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which would also include border security and end to chain migration and an end to the visa lottery, and then take up the idea of comprehensive immigration as a phase two. There was a very interesting exchange as well between Senator Lindsey Graham, who knows what it's like to try to tackle comprehensive immigration reform as part of the infamous Gang of Eight from a number of years ago, saying to the president, look, we'd like to get this done, but I'm going to get the crap beaten out of me because people will talk about amnesty, but we're not going to bring a bill to the floor of the Senate that you're not going to sign. So listen to the cover that the president gave Lindsey Graham at that meeting. Listen here. We do this properly, doctor. You're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. I will tell you a couple of things. So the president there saying, I'm willing to take the heat for you, Lindsey Graham, and other members of Congress if you put a bill like that on my desk that everybody can agree with. But the president did get some pushback from Democrats on this idea of doing everything together, which ended up not being the way that they're going to pursue it, because they said there just isn't time to do it. There's less than two months between now and March the 5th when the protections for the Dreamers have to be fixed by Congress or they're going to have to start to go home. So listen to what Senator Dick Durbin, who is the co-chairman of the Judiciary Committee said in terms of whether you should do DACA or whether you should include comprehensive immigration reform, suggesting that to do both would be too big a lift. Listen here. We have a deadline looming and a lot of lives hanging. We can agree on some very fundamental and important things together on border security, on chain, uh, on the future of diversity visas. Comprehensive, though, I worked on it for six months with Michael Bennett and uh, a number of Bob Menendez uh, and Schumer and McCain and Jeff Flake, and it took us six months to put it together. We don't have six months for the DACA. Now, after that, Senator Dianne Feinstein came out and said, well, why don't we just do a clean DACA bill, which takes care of the Dreamers problem, and then we'll do border security and everything else as part of comprehensive immigration reform. The president initially seemed to suggest that he was open to that, saying, well, that's what everybody's talking about. But then the House minority, Majority Leader, uh, Kevin McCarthy, came in and said, no, 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 wait a minute here. We've got to have border security as part of this. But by the time that the meeting com came to an end, Shep, after, again, the closed-door session where apparently the real negotiating took place. They came to an agreement, according to the White House, that they'll tackle this in two phases, DACA with border security and end-to-chain migration, and uh, the lottery as being phase one, and then comprehensive immigration reform as phase two. But, Shep, I think there's still probably some disagreement over what phase one will actually entail, and you'll probably get that difference if you talk to Republicans and Democrats separately. Yeah, give it a minute. It'll come out. Give I was it a minute. I was really happy to find out, though, that the president will be able to beat Oprah in 2020. Does everyone get a car? <laughs> well, you know, they could use a few more here at the White House, Shep, because God knows that motorcade just isn't long enough. Uh, the president was asked about that. Uh, he seemed to think that uh, despite all of the salivating by by Democrats and many members of the media who have been covering it yesterday, that Oprah probably is not going to throw her hat in the ring for 2018. Listen here. Yeah, you know, Oprah would be a lot of fun. I know her very well. You know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump. This is before politics. Her last week, and she had Donald Trump, and my family was very nice. No, I like Oprah. I don't think she's going to run. But as we said yesterday, if it did turn out to be a contest in 2020 between President Donald Trump and Oprah Winfrey on the Democratic side, that indeed would truly be one for the ages, Shep. It would indeed. John Roberts at the White House. Thank you, John. Thank you. The president today repeatedly called for Congress to return to a system of earmarks. Earmarks were the way Congress for years got things done. Here's how it worked. You're a member from the first district of Pennsylvania. You want to get a bridge built. So you go to a colleague who's against the idea and tell her you'll vote for her pet project if she'll vote for yours. The pet project gets tacked onto the back of another bill and it sails right through. In other words, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And the people will pay for it. Republicans blamed exactly that system for runaway spending. They called it pork barrel politics. John Boehner banned earmarks back in 2011 after Republicans took back Congress the year before. The president says, bring earmarks back so Congress can get something, anything done. Let's turn to John Bussey, associate editor of the Wall Street Journal. 
with which this network shares co uh, common ownership. He's also a Fox News contributor. Earmarks. Fill the swamp. Fill it fill, up. Fill, fill the swamp. Now, look, the, the argument <laughs> is if you want things to get done, earmarks yeah. is a way to do that. True. I've heard this argument before. I've heard it in Washington from people who play the game there, who say, look, it's the currency, it's the grease on the wheels. It's one way of being able to have something to trade to somebody else for their support for legislation. And the argument is that with that grease, things get done. I, it, what we saw today was extraordinary. Having the cameras in there for this negotiation, whatever it was, was, was great. But to suggest that they've come together on this DACA and immigration reform things for the phase one, is a real stretch. Yeah, it, it, it is a stretch. There's a lot more that's got to be talked through on this. There's disagreements between Republicans and Democrats on this. But this was a fascinating it was. meeting. It really was. It was. It was almost an hour of being able to sort of see uh, a president really sit as the manager of a meeting where there was a civil conversation yep. about fundamental disagreements. If you want to change the discussion, yep. if you want to move it away from a talk about your mental stability, this is the way to do it. Uh, you the president was compromising. He was in charge. He was conciliatory. He was charming. He was charming. He was happy. He was inclusive. Yes. It was astound. It was wonderful. Yes. I mean, it, it is. It is what Americans kind of hope. Uh, uh, Washington, uh, it's the way that uh, Americans kind of hope that Washington works, that there's an actual meeting where you can voice your disagreements and you can begin to sort of marshal toward some kind of conclusion. We'll see what, what yeah. comes of this. this. There's this little question. This, this was a win for the president from a political theater standpoint. Whether it is from a policy standpoint, uh, we'll have to see. Well, the, Dianne Feinstein and, and Kevin McCarthy have not come together on this matter. Now he's going to Davos. So America if, first. Yeah, if you want to walk into the world of globalization, if you want to be an abider of it uh, and participate of it, no better place than the Gab Fest, the talking shop <laughs> of Davos. Uh, for those folks who aren't familiar with it, this is a, a, a meeting of about 2,500 people who get together. They're leaders of countries, there's leaders of business, and they talk about the big issues around the world. It's been going on for decades. Uh, it's a fascinating sourcing opportunity for reporters. I've been there. But it is in the heart of sort of the, the globalization thing. And that's another way of changing the story topic, yeah. changing the story narrative. No president's been in 20 years. Right. Going now. John, thank you. <clears throat> There's huge news out of Washington on another front. And it has to do with Fusion GPS and the Trump dossier. Brand new. Next. Somebody inside President Trump's campaign was talking to the FBI. That's according to the testimony from the co-founder of Fusion GPS, the firm behind the so-called Trump dossier. We know about this because Senator Feinstein released Glenn Simpson's testimony saying the American people deserve the opportunity to read the entire transcript. So now it's public. She's the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee. As for Simpson, he testified before the committee back in August. And he called on the panel to release his full testimony and accused Republicans of leaking selected sections of it to the media. There's a lot in there. And the Fox Business Network's Adam Shapiro is working on it live on Capitol Hill. Hi, Adam. Hey, uh, Shepard. It is pretty incredible when you look at some of what's already coming out from this 10 hours of testimony from Glenn Simpson. Let me get right to it because it does mention someone within the Trump campaign feeding the FBI information. Quote, essentially what he told me, this is Mr. Simpson, was they had other intelligence about this matter from an internal Trump campaign source and that they, my understanding was that they believed Chris, that would be Christopher Steele, the man who wrote the dossier, the, the British intelligence officer, uh, Chris, at this point, that they believed Chris's information might be credible because they had other intelligence that indicated the same thing. And one of those pieces of intelligence was a human source from inside the Trump organization. Shep? Well, well the substance of this transcript, though, what, what did we learn about the issue at hand? Um, the issue at hand is that the, the Fusion GPS did indeed hire and was working with Mr. Steele. There was a shocking revelation in this that uh, Mr. Simpson did not want at one point to discuss, but apparently somebody, they say, was killed, perhaps a, a Russian officer or someone, but that someone was killed and they didn't want to reveal too much information about sources to put people in jeopardy. 
Good enough. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll have much more on this on Special Report tonight with Brett Baer. Thank you. If the special counsel asked to interview President Trump for the Russia investigation, can it, can the president refuse? As we reported yesterday, sources tell Fox News the president's legal team is preparing for a possible request from the special counsel Robert Mueller. President Trump has said that he would be willing to sit down with Robert Mueller, and he repeatedly denied that there was any collusion between his campaign and Russia. But what if he decides he doesn't want to go answer questions? Let's bring in the Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. If a grand jury wants to hear testimony from somebody, it doesn't matter who it is, they get it, don't yes. they? Yes. Yeah, so if Bob Mueller requests the president to sit down with him and the president doesn't want to, he can decline it, just like any person can decline to speak to the FBI or decline to speak to a sure. federal prosecutor. But if the grand jury subpoenas the president, as a grand jury once subpoenaed President Bill Clinton, who testified, the a subpoena is a command. The president would have to show up and take an oath. Then it would be up to him and his lawyers whether he wanted to answer questions. The proceeding is in secret to the extent that anything stays secret. And just days. like anyone else, you could invoke the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination if yes. you chose to, but politically that might be complicated. Yes, but what it seems like we are moving toward, and I'm just, just reading between the lines from the things the president's people mm -hmm. have been saying, is a voluntary meeting between the president and his lawyers yep. and Bob Mueller and his FBI agents, not under oath, but a conversation. That, in my view, and in the view of almost anybody that does this for a living, who, who focuses on the relationship between the government and individuals in a judicial or legal uh, context, would be catastrophic for the president. But wait, if, if, you, if you go speak with them, but not under oath, if you get something wrong or you say something that's inaccurate or false, it's one kind of thing. But if you are under oath, it's perjury and that's impeachable. Except that the penalty for lying and the penalty for perjury is the same. General Flynn, for example, two FBI agents, this is General Flynn's version, showed up at his office and said, hey, General, can we talk to you for a few minutes? During the course of that, he lied. We know he lied because he admitted he lied. And in that admission, he pleaded guilty to lying. So walking into this environment, particularly a person who likes to talk, who believes he's smarter than the other side, but who doesn't know the facts in the case or the evidence that the government has, is really walking into a very, very, very dangerous situation. You say catastrophic. Go on from there. Because if they want to trap him, they will find a way to do so, since they know the documents and the facts in the case far better than he does. So there's a couple of rules of thumb that criminal defense lawyers always follow. And one of them's kind of a funny one-liner. It's many, many years old, but it still makes sense. Don't talk to a guy that owns a grand jury. Mm -hmm. Because there are two grand juries here. Bob Mueller would get to decide which one. One's in the suburbs, one's in downtown D.C. Entirely different makeup. He could bring evidence to either one he can choose of President Trump dis being deceptive during the uh, proceedings if they ask him questions that causes him to be uh, deceptive. And that can be the basis for an indictment. Very, very dangerous environment, not just for President Trump, but for anybody who's in the government's crosshairs to sit down and speak with the government cannot help the person in the crosshairs. It can only help the government. Mm. I'm curious. Have you talked to the president about this? No. No. Okay. No. I was just curious. No. Mm. All right, Judge. Okay, Chef. Well, well, how do you think this is going to go? I mean, the, the negotiation is not to get him out of the talking. It's to set the rules for the talk. My prediction is that the president will overrule his lawyers and will sit down and speak with uh, Mueller because he probably believes he can talk Mueller out of proceeding further. And that, in my view, is an erroneous belief. Will they be recording it? Uh, they'll be making notes. That'll be something to, to negotiate whether or not it's being recorded. When he's not under oath, then it's up to both sides whether or not it's going to be recorded. When he is under oath, then every, if, 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 if that happens, so that would only happen in front of a grand jury, mm -hmm. then everything would be recorded. I, I would, the vote would be for recording around here. Journalists I like recording. I would think so, yes. <laughs> well, when Bill Clinton uh, testified. Depends on what the definition that is. Correct, correct. We didn't see the grand jury. We saw the back of the head of the interrogator, and we saw the president answering. It was a full grand jury there, and everything was recorded. And it went badly for him. Well, it's memorable. Yes. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. There's more coming. There's top of the hour headlines in a few minutes. Cavuto will step in eventually. It's a great day. 13 minutes before the hour now, after the president's big immigration meeting with lawmakers, 
The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he still hopes to bring up the Dreamers bill separately from a plan to keep the government running. But the top Democrat in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, is still pushing for immigration to be part of the spending bill. Congress has 10 days to avoid a government shutdown. Let's turn to Politico reporter Alex Eisenstadt. Did the ball move? Are we in a different place now than we were before this meeting? Well, it's hard to tell in part because this meeting today really seemed uh, in, in large part about theatrics. Trump wanted to push back against the, these news reports in recent days and weeks that he somehow isn't engaged, these questions about his mental stability, this notion that he's somehow not working that much. And he wanted to show that he was really in command. And so that was really the purpose of today's meeting, was to sort of show that he's able to relate, interact, and deal with members of Congress. So it's hard to tell how much further we are along right now, in part because this was really a lot about theatrics. There were a few things, though, that were substantial. For instance, he will sign protection for dreamers. The president made right. that perfectly clear. He's like, bring me a right. bill. I will sign it. I'm not going to mess around on this. He also, the big, beautiful 2,000 mile long wall that he talked about extensively and repeatedly, no more. Some border wall here, some border wall there, some drone stuff, all that kind of stuff. And he's, he's moved on those matters. That's what they call compromise in Washington. Absolutely. It was interesting to hear him uh, say, sort of suggest that he would be open to a, to a compromise, particularly after the campaign. Uh, it, it, it seemed like he was uh, perhaps he was perhaps moving on that issue a little bit. But, you know, he can't give up talking about the wall no matter what. He, he, he just has to continue talking about it largely for political reasons. It is such the wall and the no. And so it doesn't matter that he knows it's not going to happen. He has to talk right. about it because of politics, even if it's not true. It, 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 correct. It's so Ugh. important symbolically Vomit. to his base and to what he talked about during the campaign. He has to continue talking about the wall, though you'll know that, as you've noted in this program, it's not a, exactly clear at this point what the wall exactly means. At border this point. security. What is, it made it perfectly clear. It means border exactly. security. It, it, it's this amorphous thing at this point. Well, it, on, on top of that, we, we also have Diane Feinstein Diane still saying they want a clean DACA bill. In other words, First, protect the dreamers, the hundreds of thousands who have been here living in this country since they were children. Protect them and then work on the rest of it. Where the president seemed, at first he said that was okay, but then after, you know, a, a, a notch on the shoulder there from across the room, he right. said, well, we, we, we have to get something done. We have to get some border protection done in the beginning, then we'll do comprehensive after that. Right. It, it, and per, perhaps the president wasn't totally clear on what uh, Senator Feinstein meant when she said clean yeah, probably. DACA bill. But, but, but here's the thing is that it's really hard to get all of this done by early March. It just it, it takes a while to get this stuff done. Co immigration is just such a complicated issue. So it's hard to see all of what we're, they talked about today in this meeting necessarily coming to fruition. At the same time, they're dealing, of course, with this short term spending uh, uh, pro issue, and they got to get that figured out in the next couple of weeks. Alex Eisenstadt from Politico, from the Politico Brain Hub. It's nice to see you, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, here's another one that popped up out of nowhere today uh, Joe Arpaio. Joe Arpaio cracking down on prisoners, on illegal immigrants got in a lot of trouble president got him out of it now he's going to run for the senate one of president trump's closest and most controversial allies says he's running for u.s senate the former maricopa county arizona sheriff joe arpaio announcing his bid to fill the senate's open i should say that state's open senate seat the 85 year old calls himself america's toughest sheriff and kept notoriously harsh conditions at his Phoenix area jail. Critics say he racially profiled. One federal judge ruled his policing methods were illegal. But supporters, including the president, say he kept Arizona safe. Trace Gallagher with more on this. Trace? 
Shep, he's threatened to run so many times when he announced his candidacy today, some media outlets thought Joe Arpaio was kidding, but he says he is very serious because, and I'm quoting, he says, I'm sick of the smugness that has taken over the Senate chamber, and I am fed up with career politicians and their talking points. It's time for the Senate to repair the confidence of the American people. The announcement comes just five months after President Trump pardoned Arpaio for criminal contempt. The case stemmed from a civil matter alleging Arpaio racially profiled Latinos while he was sheriff. He was voted out of office in 2016. If he's elected, he would be 86 on the day he's sworn in among the oldest freshman senators in history. But Arpaio says he wouldn't do it if he felt he couldn't put all of his energy into being elected. Civil rights activists are already slamming his Senate run, saying that he couldn't even win re-election to the sheriff's office he held for decades. And the Democratic National Committee chair, Tom Perez, saying Joe Arpaio is one of our nation's most notorious agents of racism and bigotry. He has spent his career tearing apart immigrant families, 